<clears throat> well, technology is great. Yeah, I could see the uh, attendees, at least the names. You could see the attendees? Yeah, I could see the names of the attendees. So right now we have 17 attendees. Ah, I see. Oh. Mm, okay. May I ask you a question? Sure. The the chat uh, section is not for me, right? Uh, say that again. Uh, I can see uh, the, this is the icon with the chat. There's about 11, 11 people are chatting. Oh, can someone answer Dr. Alapona? Well, okay, I, I have an answer, thank you. All right, so, <clears throat> start. Okay, uh, my name is Uriah Kim. I'm the interim president and the dean of the Graduate Theological Union. It is indeed my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the GTU's annual Surjit Singh lecture, which honors the life and work of the late Dr. Surjit Singh, who was professor of Christian philosophy at the San Francisco Theological Seminary and also at the GTU from 1962 to 1988. This lectureship started in 1992 in order to showcase the GTU as a leading center for fostering interreligious and cross-cultural communication and understanding without compromising the integrity and essential telos of a religion or a culture by bringing to the G GTU a distinguished scholar or religious leader to address religion and culture from a cross-cultural perspective. 
This year's event is particularly special for a number of reasons, not least of which is that we are able to go forward with it at all. In a time when a global pandemic has upended many of our customary modes of congregating, connecting, and engaging with one another. And yet, modern technology makes it possible for us to do just that, and to do so regardless of geographic and other barriers. So this year, while somewhat unconventional in format, I am nonetheless delighted to be holding our first SING lecture as a webinar, and to have the distinguished Dr. Jacob Olupona with us to deliver his talk titled, Rethinking the Study of African Indigenous Religion in the 21st Century. To share just a bit about Dr. Olupona, this afternoon, he joins us from his house from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he serves as faculty of divinity and faculty of arts and sciences at Harvard University. A noted scholar of indigenous African religions, his research has spanned such topics as religious pluralism in Africa and the Americas, African spirituality and ritual practices, spirit possession, phenomenology, and currently focuses on the religious practices of Africans who have emigrated to the United States over the last 40 years. Since inviting him to join us as this year's speaker several months ago, I have eagerly anticipated his remarks and look forward to what they will add to the rich and diverse conversations about religion, theology, culture, and practice taking place daily across the DTU. Should you have any questions during the talk, please hold them until the end when we will take a limited number for a brief Q&A. Now, on behalf of our faculty and wider academic community, please, Join me in welcoming Dr. Olopona. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to give the things lecture for this year. I must say to you that my connection and relationship with your university began several years ago. When I was a professor at the University of California, Davis, I used to come to your university to examine some of your students. I suspect that most of these students are now professors in various African and European universities. I must also mention that my first publication as a graduate student on civil religion in Nigeria, which I did for my former teacher, Professor Peter Boga, was actually an essay chosen by one of your journals. And I think it is called the Church Divinity Monograph. <laughs> I don't know if you still have this journal. So I'm glad that at least I've had this long relationship uh, with you. Let me thank Dean Kim for agreeing to host this lecture. And also thank the former president, Rabbi Lichman, who actually sent me the letter of invitation. I also want to welcome all the listeners and members of the GTU community for bringing me to uh, give this lecture. The title of my talk, as you have been told, is Rethinking the Study of African Indigenous Religion in the 21st Century. It is a well-known fact 
that religion continues to play a major, major role in the lives of African people. The much cited dictum by the doyen of African religious studies, the recently deceased Professor John Mbiti, that Africans are deeply religious. He actually used the word notoriously religious, which have changed to deeply religious. The dictum still holds true. And well, officially, statistics suggest that African Christians and Muslims constitute about 8% of the total population. And African religions uh, constitute probably just 20%. These statistics do not reflect the truth of the African situation. The African religious worldview is primarily indigenous. And although Islam and Christianity continuously respond to its viability and strength through their transitive approaches, their theologies and their knowledge systems reflect the African worldview. Similarly, indigenous African religion, worldviews and rituals, such as rites of passage and other religious performances are permeated by other religions, culture and society in general as well. Initially, Christian missionaries and propagators of Islam assumed that indigenous religion was just going to disappear. Eventually, fizzle out, and Islam and Christianity will take, uh, take over. But the truth of the matter is that African religious worldview continues to dominate African society and culture. Whether as Christians or Muslims, we think primarily as African in the first instance. And if you push me on this, I will add to it that if I sleep and I have a kind of a bad dream, and this often happens, it is most likely that the first thing I'll do as a Christian is to call on my friends and my relations to continue to pray for me because it's real. So we frame our lives, we live our culture according to the African sensibilities and African culture and tradition. As scholars of the comparative study of religion in Africa, we must begin to rethink the study of African religion in the 21st century, primarily to avoid the continuous misassessment of the resilience of indigenous traditions. Indigenous religions are definitive of the African identity as African religion and culture provides the language, the ethos, the knowledge, and the ontology that make the proper formation of African personhood possible, that constitute communal identity and value system that despite the influence of Islam and Christianity, claims to dominate and to, in fact, lead the Africans in the way they think, act, and do their thing. One of my former professors at the University of Nigeria, Suka, defined culture in a very simple way, how people do their thing. So how we do our thing in Africa is very relevant to this. For example, imagine an African village or city devoid of its primordial ritual processes, its festivals, ceremonies, or sacred princes. Imagine that they have all been destroyed and removed and replaced by Islam and Christianity. Such places will ultimately lose not only their identity, but also lose their essence and beingness. So today's lecture, we attempt to re refocus the centrality of indigenous religion, not only in defining African cosmology and African worldview, but also in defining the African personality in the 21st century.
What is African religion? This is a big question. The range of African indigenous beliefs and practices has been referred to as African traditional religions in an effort to encompass the breadth and depth of religious traditions on the continent. This is why at times when you pick up a book, you see the word religion, and at times you see the word religions. The diversity of the traditions themselves is tremendous, making it next to impossible for all of them to be captured in a single presentation. For starters, even the word religion used in reference to this tradition is itself problematic for many Africans because it suggests that religion is separate from other aspects of one's culture and society and indeed the environment. But the truth of the matter is that African religion can never be separated from all of this. It is a way of life and it can never be seen as something different from public sphere. It informs everything in traditional African society, including politics, arts, marriage system, health, diet, economics, and even death. Despite its diversity and the contiguity of seemingly unrelated aspects as visible in different religious traditions, there are several common features of African traditional religious beliefs and practices that can be discussed as derivative of African indigenous religion. These shared features suggest similar origins and can lead to African religions to be created as a single religious tradition, just as Christianity and Islam would. And this would be my approach this lecture. And despite the plethora of ethnic traditions and sects, and there are more than one million of them, African religious continues to be viewed as a single entity. There are three central aspects of the tradition that can be generalized for the purpose of this presentation. One, there is a supreme God or being who created the universe and every living and non-living thing to be found within the universe. Often this supreme God is assisted by smaller gods or deities who are subordinate to him or her and who perform different functions in relation to the one supreme being. What is very interesting about it is that in the local vocabulary. The Supreme God is described as the great God. The Yoruba will talk about him as Orisha Agbaye. The word Orisha there means deity. Agbaye means the universal God. So there is a relationship between him and the lesser deities that are seen as his lieutenants. So he is the first in the hierarchy of deities. Second, of course, would be the spiritual beings who occupy the next tier in the cosmology and they constitute a pantheon of deities. Mbiti divides spirit beings into two types, nature and human spirits. Each has a life force that no concrete physical form so nature spirits are associated with objects seen in nature, so that mountains, the sun, trees, natural for, uh, uh, forces, such as wind and rain. I must warn here that these natural forces are hierophanies. That is places where the spirits and the deities manifest themselves. This was what the missionaries mistook for paganism. Human spirits are represented by people who have died, usually ancestors in the recent 
period or even in the, in the distant uh, past. So objects and forces in the sky and net are both represented by spirits. Thirdly, the world of the ancestors, which continue to play a role in the community affairs after a person has died, is very, very central to this cosmology and worldview. And as spirits, human spirits, they are more powerful than living humans. And they act as intermediaries between gods and those who are still living. A fourth attribute of African traditional religion, I should add to this, is that Africans live their faith rather than compartmentalize it into something to be practiced on certain days or in a certain, certain uh, place. It is not a Sunday Sunday religious tradition. Catholic moral theologians, Laurentia Magessi argues that unlike the clothes one wears and can take off at will, for African religion is the skin in which they live. So John Mbiti is also captured this unique aspects in the following passage. And permit me to quote uh, him. <clears throat> Because traditional religion permit all the departments of life, there is no formal distinction between the sacred and the secular, between religions and non-religions, between the spiritual and material areas of life. Wherever the African is, there is his religion. He carries it to the fields where he's sowing seeds, harvesting a new crop. He takes it with him to be a party, to, to attend the funeral, etc. cetera. Mbiti was quite right in describing African religion in this manner. <clears throat> the most difficult task I face in characterizing African indigenous spiritual dimensions is accounting for its diversity and complexity. One approach would be to outline in a systematic way these essential features some of which I've already enumerated, without paying much attention to whether or not the particular traditions fit into the pattern of religions already mapped out by Western theologians and historians who use Western religious traditions as a standard for constructing what religion should look like in other parts of the world. In other words, as an exercise in comparative study of religion, where we are, are mindful of these Western structures and Western constructions of religion, we must keep in mind that African religious traditions do not always fit into these structures. For example, the reference to doctrine, to beliefs in Western Judeo-Christian tradition. Unlike the Christocentric structure that guided earlier perspectives, and approaches to the study of African religions. Contemporary study of African religions should endeavor to provide not only awareness of social cultural context, but also narrate the historical dimensions of these traditions. Let me begin with a consideration of myth and cosmologies. The narratives about the creation of the universe, the cosmogony, and the nature and structure of the world, cosmology, provide useful entry point to our understanding of African religious life and worldview. These narratives come to us in the form of what in scholarly language is often called myths. Unlike in popular usage, myths are sacred stories believed to be true by those who hold on to them. Myths reveal critical events and episodes of profound importance and of transcendental significance to the African people who espouse them. Myths deal with events involving the centrality of superhuman entities, of the gods, the spirits, 
ancestors, etc. One must resist the structural idolatry's temptation, which view myth as static, unchanging, and simply production of a people's imagination about the cosmic order. On the contrary, myths are oral narratives passed from one generation to the other and represented and reinterpreted by each generation who make these events revealed in the myths relevant and meaningful to their present situation. I must quickly mention here that this is why in most African communities and cultures, there is very difficult, it is very difficult to separate what we often call myths from history. Myths, history, oral narratives, they are all interwoven and they do mean the same thing in most places. As it meets the world over, African mythology has multiple often contradictory versions of the same event. African cosmogonic narratives posit the creation of a universe and the birth of a people and their indigenous religions. Myths are also stories about how the world was put into place by a divine power, usually a supreme God, but in collaboration with other lesser supernatural beings or deities who act on its behalf or aid in the creative process. Well, like the Christian community recited stories of creation, they are not performed by a single God who ordered by fiat the creation of the universe by mere spoken words. Some biblical cosmological narratives have parallels in African cosmogony. For example, when the Supreme God summons the host of heavens and declares to them, come, let us make man in our own image. This same script appears in the creation of Yoruba word when Olodumare or Orishagbaye designates to the Orishas, the other deities, the job of, the cre of creating the universe. The point I'm trying to make here is that unlike in the book of, of, of uh, Genesis or the Christians that we are familiar with as Christians and Jews, in the story of the creation of the Yoruba world, God himself, the Supreme God, took an active part, but he sends the deities to perform different functions that led to the creation of the Yoruba world. Secondly, in spite of the heuristic value of V.Y. Mudimbi's distinction between myth and history in Africa, and by extension, the cohesion of oral and written narratives, the notion that myth is non-rational and unscientific, why the latter is critical and rational is false. It is not an African thing. For one thing, a sizable number of African myths deal with events considered to have actually happened as narrated by the people themselves or as reformulated into symbolic expressions of historical events. Symbolic and mythic narratives may exist side by side with narratives of legends in history that bear similar characteristics with motives and events of creation or coming to bear. On the other hand, we now know from research and I cover our sources that by their very nature, sources and records of missionaries, colonial administrators, and indigenous elites, which were preserved by colonial administrators, were equally susceptible to distortion and perforation, having been written from the angle of an invented modernity that the colonizers considered superior to the worldview of local people. You notice, for example, in the archives that there were lots of silences on the role of women you know, in most of these indigenous traditions. Even silences that reflect the role of goddesses uh, in, you know, in some of these traditions. So we must be very careful as we assess the importance and significance of narratives and mythology to 
take very seriously what I think is the most important thing in comparative study of religion is to weigh, you know, what we're doing and to see the biases in some of the traditions we accepted as true. Thirdly, the mechanisms and techniques of creation vary from story to story and from one tradition to another. And where scholars have often argued that Africans' indigenous accounts of creation were ex nihilo, as the biblical account of creation is often portrayed. African cosmological narratives generally indicate there is never one pattern governing how creation happens. All over the continent, cosmological myths are defined as a complicated process, whether the universe involves from pre-existing objects or from God's mere thought or speech. Whichever way it happens, African cosmological narratives are similarly complex, unsystematized, and multivariant, and are the bedrock for indigenous value systems. As such, even within a single ethnic group or clan, there are often highly contexted and even opposing stories or viewpoints when it comes to creation accounts, thus allowing for flexibility and humanotic creativity. The absence of centralized and unified cosmologies indicate the multifaceted nature of African religions, life and worldviews. African spirituality simply acknowledges that beliefs and practices touch on and inform every aspect of human life. And therefore, African religion cannot be separated from the everyday and the mundane aspects of life. Another important feature of African indigenous spirituality is that it is not a closed theological system. It doesn't have a fixed creed like many forms of Christianity or Islam. Traditionally, Africans have different ideas on what role the ancestors play in the lives of the living descendants. Religious worldviews, often unique to distinct ethnic groups, reflect people's identities and lie at the heart of how they relate to one another, to other people, and to the world at large. Thus, these religions act as a sort of code by which African people exist and integrate religious expressions into their daily lives. Although it is difficult to generalize about African traditional cosmology and worldviews, a common denominator among them is a three-tiered model in which the human world exists sandwiched between the sky and the earth, including the underworld, a schema that is not unique to African, but found in many of the world religious systems as well. A porous border exists between the human realm and the sky, which belongs to the gods. Similarly, although ancestors dwell inside the earth or the under earth or the ground, if you like, the activities are interjected, also interject human life, which is why they are referred to as the living dead. The point I'm trying to make here is that one of the reasons why the earth is so sacred to the African people is because it is the home of the ancestors. African cosmologies therefore portray the universe as a fluid, active, and impersonable space with agents from each realm bearing the capabilities of traveling from one realm to another at will. In this way, the visible and the invisible are in tandem 
leading practitioners to speak about all objects, whether animate or inanimate, as potentially sacred on some level. So the world in which we live in now, the human world, is not just secular. It's filled with the spirits, it's the influence of the ancestors in it, and humans are, take cognizance of how active these deities and these entities are in the world in which they live in. The notion of ritual as central to the performance of religion is very important here. Ceremonies of naming, rites of passage, death and other calendrical rites embody, enact and reinforce the sacred values communicated in myth. They often dictate when the community honors a particular divinity or observes particular taboos. Divinities and ancestors have personalized annual festivals during which devotees and adepts offer sacrificial animals, libations, and favored foods to propitiate them. Rituals enable supernatural beings to bless individuals and the community with sustenance, prosperity, and fecundity. Rites of passage, such as initiation ceremonies, are rituals marking personal transitions recognized and celebrated by the community. Each ceremony den denotes passage from one social status to another, and it's an opportunity to celebrate the initiates on their new journey. And if I may use a uh, cite an example that may be of interest to you, in my own home place, Ute our tradition in southwestern Nigeria, there's a rite of passage called Ero Festival, which is the la last rite of passage you perform before death. Uh, it's not based on Western calendar, that is when you turn 70, as is this in the Christian tradition, but it's according to the eighth grade system. Uh, in two years' time, I'll be qualified to be to perform the Euro Festival. And it is mandatory for me to go back to the village, join members of my group, uh, members of my lineage, I mean, uh, age group, to perform a row festival. The most important prayer, the Ute of our people will give or pray to a young man like myself, is that may I live in long to perform a row festival with my peers. This is very different from the Christians celebrating 70. I guess in my case, I will celebrate it when I'm 70. And I also wait for my turn to do the Euro festival. This is the power of tradition. And I think I need to let you uh, know that. As a lived religion, African tradition deploys through its ritual processes, particularly this rites of passage, calendrical rituals, and divinatory practices, tangible material and non-material phenomena, not only to regulate life events and occurrences in order to ensure communal well-being, African religion supplies knowledge to live by and also a transfer of tradition, worldview, ethical orientation, principles of what is right or wrong, and an ontology, a way of life. And hence, the aforementioned rituals have become not only the open system to the understanding of African tradition and religion, but also to the visible manifestations and essence of African religious traditions. As we may know, initiation for adolescents, African girls, cause great contestation among Westerners because they often involve rites like female circumcision or other bodied practices. Female circumcision is a hotly contested practice condemned by many global organizations and even Africans themselves and lumped together under the category of female genital mutilation. Few have much clarity or knowledge on what is actually involved here. Most importantly, the right itself 
should not be condemned together with circumcision or FGM. The circumcision is condemned by the Africans themselves because they know that it is not good for the African girls. So, but what one agrees or disagrees with the practice, it is important to note that not all female initiations involve circumcision and that the rituals associated with initiations are crucial to ensuring that an individual's social position is affirmed by both family and community. So for this reason, the communal aspects of such rituals have due to their salience been retained in many parts of Africa, such as the Maasai people in Kenya and in Somalian culture, both in Djibouti and Somalia itself, why doing away with the circumcision practices altogether due to the heritage associated with it? It's, a, it's an offense to perform female circumcision in most African countries today. African traditional religions are structured very differently from Western religion in that there's relatively little formal structure African religions do not rely on a single individual to be a religious leader, but rather depend on the, an entire community to make the religion work. Priests, priestesses, divine kings, diviners, etc., are the authorities who perform religious ceremonies. But the hierarchical structure is often very loose. So depending on the kinds of religious activity being performed, different religious authorities can be leaders for specific events. So the cosmological structure, however, is much more defined and precise. African religions are therefore a praxis. The focus is on the practice of religion. And this is where the focus uh, should be as we begin to think about where we're going to put emphasis in our research. They provide the orientation for the human life journey by defining what I've described earlier on as the rites of passage. Every life stage is important in the tradition. Every stage of tradition is important, be it marriage, the truth, et etc., and even death. Each tradition or transition has a function in the society and the rituals are performed to ensure that these transitions properly take place. I'd like to uh, very quickly move to a very an interesting and central aspects of African indigenous religion that is often left out in our work on our research. And that is the tradition of secret kingship and what I'll call civil religion as I deal with this. The insight that propelled my earlier scholarship was that the ideology and rituals of Yoruba secret kingship are what define Yoruba civil religion. And this will also apply to other African communities. Yoruba civil religion, and indeed forms the center of Yoruba identity. Sociologists, and my former uh, Robert Bella, understand civil religion as a sacred principle and central ethic that unites a people without which societies cannot function. And later on, my own teacher, Peter Boga at Boston University, will sort of expansiate that. And that's what led me to writing about civil religion in, uh, published in your journal, which I referred to earlier on. Civil religion incorporates common myths, history, values, symbols that relate to a society's sense of collective identity. In the case of the Yorubas of Southwestern Nigeria, kings and their people, Sacred kingship formed a sacred canopy 
that sheltered the followers of each of the three major traditions, be it Islam, Christianity, and indigenous religion. Forging bonds of community, identity among the followers of the different faith tradition. So in other words, an attempt is made here in this analysis to separate in the, the practice of indigenous religion that the Yoruba so called Orisha tradition from traditions and rituals that relate to the sacred king or the sacred kingship. So we are dealing with a fourth dimension of religion here, not the three, the triple heritage, as we often mention that. Uh, uh, this was a very profound um, interpretation uh, and I'm glad that my colleagues in the study of African religion have sort of recognized the importance of this, the structures of this schema. Later in my academic life, I explored theoretical issues at the national level, showing how Nigerian civil religion and invisible faith provided a template for assessing how we feared at nation building, allowing the symbols of Nigerian nationhood to take on religious significance for the Nigerian public, uh, uh, public space and beyond any particular cultural communities of faith. So the point I'm making and the importance of this is that both at the local level, at the indigenous level, we can talk about a civil religion of a particular local community. Also at the national level, we can also talk about uh, a civil religion. In fact, a distinction made by a number of scholars to, uh, to uh, deal with this was that uh, in societies that are highly pluralistic and that do not have strong civil religion, it's incumbent on the ruler or whoever is in charge to create one so that they can create you know, a kind of a community that will accept their pluralism and that will uh, have at the center of it a point of reference that they regard as important, as sacred. That's why I often refer to it as an invisible faith tradition. I do, want, I do not want to be misunderstood here. According, uh, advocating for civil religion in a religiously pluralistic society does not require the erasure of conventional religious tradition. Rather, institutional religion continues to grow in relevance and in the national imagination whether its invocation are part of the conversations concerning nation building or metasini or Boko Haram violence in Nigeria, the secularism debate, the Sharia debate, the question of Islamic banking and the role of organization of Islamic con conference, all those issues that have caused division within Nigeria. With this in mind, this lecture also aims to explore the place of religion in Africa and Nigerian contemporary af uh, affairs. By religion here, I refer not only to institutional religion and the beliefs and practices as they relate to the sacred and the transcendence, but also to practices not, that are not always defined as religions including rites of passage offered by in, in various myths and, and practice by our youth, and also the values of communalism and national sacrifice. Religion also encompasses the human cultural dimension <coughs> within faith tradition, such as how human agency shapes, influences, and complicates religious control. Thus, um, I examine religion not only as a sacred phenomenon, but also as a cultural and human reality, all the while remembering the importance of integrating the social political dimension of religiosity into our examination of the crisis of Nigerian or the African, African state. The point I'm trying to make here is that Africa must go back to its tradition, not asking people to go and reconvert to traditional religion, but to look for those value systems and those myths and narratives 
that their ancestors have used to build their nations so that they can come to that to uh, begin to see how relevant this can be in forging national unity. Uh, the practice of democracy is important. And I'm not against it. But quite often, these things are based on foreign models that do not have relevance to the African systems. Let me quickly talk about the importance of divination and the importance of divinatory practices. In the context of comparative study of religion, there is nothing different in the functions of African religion as compared to other religious traditions. If something is to be found in Islam, Christianity, and even Buddhism, chances are it also appears in other traditions, including African religions. So what I'm arguing or saying here is that I don't want to argue for a particular uniqueness of African religion, as if it is not or it's not similar to other traditions. But what is important here is to see how its manifestations, the manifestations differ from other traditions, including Islam and Christianity. As I've argued in the past, indigenous religion has always played a pivotal role in the African public sphere. In indigenous religion, communities are governed according to the dictates of the gods, particularly through the divination system, such as Fa in Benin Republic and Ifa in Southwestern Nigeria. I must also say that Ifa uh, uh, is practiced in places in the Americas, in places outside, uh, outside uh, 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 Nigeria. Um, the West African tradition is so vast, and if I, it's a common tradition in, uh, in most of these places. What is fascinating about Ifa that may also be of interest to you is that the oral tradition, the text, what is called Udu in Ifa, supports a number of key cardinal principles of some other tradition. And the similarities are so vast that scholars of comparative history of religions must begin to engage in this tradition. For example, an Ifa text says, Imoralanda Kiatu Daifa, that is, the diviner is a counselor. It's a spiritual lead, it's a psychologist, it's a medicine man and medicine woman, and a spiritual guide of villages and towns. So it's suggesting that before we consult divination, which is a ritual practice, we first of all give cancer to the devotee that has come for assistance. If our divination system is very complex, it produced 256 chapters of oral narratives, what is often called Udu. Constitutes an encyclopedia, an encyclopedic compendium of knowledge that provides answers to nearly every meaningful human questions in Yoruba form and other West African traditions. So I'm trying to say to you now that if it is possible for us to put together all these narratives, we may have a document in our hand that is larger than the Quran and the Bible put together. How does that look? If I defines Yoruba and form humanity, providing responses to critical issues of its communities, Ironically, the pivotal source of knowledge and spiritual edifice that the modern day Yoruba reject as constituting paganism because the missionaries and Islamists have told us that this, they, they are all from the devil. They should be thrown into the garbage. Um, 
this tradition has now become the cornerstone of global oral tradition in Brazil, Cuba, and the Caribbean. Uh, I think it was one of my daughters who uh, reminded me that some years ago, I told her that there's a, a, a passage in Ifa text that suggests that Ifa may have to come back to Southwestern Nigeria through this practice in Brazil, Cuba, and the Caribbean. This is already happening. Africans in the diaspora are returning in large numbers to Nigeria, to Benin, to Ghana, to practice Orisha tradition. We can talk about it during questions and answer time. Divination enables us to recognize how indigenous traditions have a foundation upon which knowledge and knowledge production is developed. We must be careful not to give the impression that African religious lives are completely compartmentalized into what is often called the triple tradition, that is Islam, Christianity, and African traditional religion. And I think I've tried to explain this before. In the lived experiences of the people, there has been so much borrowing and interchange, particularly in those places that have a history of peaceful coexistence among diverse religious traditions, as it is among the Yoruba. One of the reasons why the Yorubas are highly cited in the literature in the whole world in comparative history of religions is because of this point that I have just made, that the traditions have, have, have permeated and these traditions sort of talk about each other. There's a, almost a commentary of Ifa on Islam and Christianity. There's a verse of Ifa that says, for example, Ayela Bafa, Ayela Bamale, Osanga Gani, Ibabode, is an indication that it's a historical fact that Islam was in Yoruba land for centuries before Christianity. Uh, uh, came that after indigenous religion, you also we also had uh, Islam, and then Christianity came at a later at a later time. Um, I must say here that the uh, I won't have enough time to give you more examples to indicate how Ifa and Islam sort of. Uh, I think some of my writings have also uh, talked about it. Uh, we had a conference here on Ifa divination several years ago, and the professors of Islam around were surprised to listen to the paper on Ifa and Islam. The commentary that Ifa had on the practice of Islam was shocking to them. One of the verses of Ifa talked about the importance of climbing Mount Arafat. And he was, you know, talking to a Muslim. If you fail to, to climb Mount Arafat to perform that ritual, you have not done the Hajj. I remember the professor of Islam turned to me and said, Jacob, are you aware that some Muslims do not even know the importance of what Ifa has just said? Let me quickly move to gender and the role of women in African tradition. Another false impression often given about African tradition is that women do not play a central role in the performance and leadership in these traditions. This is far from the truth. Gender dynamics are important in African tradition and in cultural system. So much so that women goddesses and women invented rituals are commonplace. What constitute a sizable number of the devotees of this, uh, women constitute a sizable number of the devotees of this tradition. In fact, the devotees of the tradition will tell you that without women, there cannot even be tradition. One of the more fascinating conversations that has emerged in the debate about African 
indigenous tradition is not just the central role of women as bearers and transmitters of it, but also the negotiation of gender dynamics is very common as the case of Oshun goddess in Yoruba tradition clearly shows. At the end of the day, as you listen to the drama between Oshun, the goddess of Oshun cool water, and the rest of the gods in the creation of the universe, we came to the conclusion that the gods cannot accomplish anything without recognizing the importance of Oshun, and in fact, asking for her permission. Whereas in certain contexts and communities, we have documented in very many instances the central role of goddesses as founders of traditions, builders of kingdoms and saviors, and defenders of critics and civilizations. Yet, some scholars find it very difficult to continue to recognize the importance of women in this tradition. Examples that can also cite will be Morimi in Yoruba land, Nzinga in Angola, and Oshun in West Africa. Women are revered as essential to the cosmic balance of the world. And as the late African historian Sheikh Anta Diop argued, matriarchy was embedded in the African way of life. In as much as androcentrism, androcentric authority was more prominent within social structures and systems, and patriarchy is more pronounced in the social order, women are considered the cornerstone of African family systems. Apart from a few instances in West Africa where women actually ruled as kings, the designation queen, quote unquote, was not often used in isolation from the position itself, which was defined in male terms. I cannot forget my encounter in a town called Ondo in southwestern Nigeria when I did my fieldwork for my PhD uh, uh, dissertation, where they do have a woman king, apart from a, a, a man king. And, a, uh, and as I, I wrote uh, at that time, you know, tape recorders and this is not that common. So I kind of noted uh, uh, her name was Pupupu and I put in, in, in quote, queen. And one of the chiefs looked at this, he saw my note, he said, doctor, no, 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 no. Pupupu was a king, not a queen. Very, very important point. The African mother is a vibrant life force central in African religious understanding of the interrelatedness between the human and the divine as she embodies the production of life and the sustaining of life uh, given to her. Thus many practitioners of African religion, particularly in the shrines of goddesses are women, emphasizing the parity with which African religious treats gender and gender related issues. African American women are turning more and more to goddess religions and Orisha practices as they find African religion offering them greater religious autonomy than other Western religious traditions. Let me now turn to the last segment of my lecture. And here I'd like to look at African religion in the creation of African diasporic religions. A critical aspect to consider in the comparative study of African religions is the reality of the transfer of these traditions across the Atlantic through the Middle Passage and transnational migration and cultural exchange. The formation of African diasporic religions in the crucible of forced and voluntary migrations led to the intermingling of African religions with Christianity and local cultures in the transatlantic world to form novel religious expressions. Religions of the African diaspora are of particular note and importance to the comparative study of African religions due to their resistance 
and characteristics formations leading to their performance and expression. Religions such as, such as Candomblé, Voodoo, Santeria, and the Caribbean traditions and Orisha traditions as practiced in North America, historically came about from African transactions with the New World, where they encountered the old traditions and from it grew these new forms of traditions that we just, we just uh, uh, named. So this encounter with Euro-Christian worldview and through their mixing, a new kinds of religious emerge, forming the basis for what we have come to know as African diasporic religions. As a teacher and a researcher uh, here at Harvard, and in my, in my former place at UC Davis, I always make sure that my students who do African indigenous religion also do African diasporic religions. Not only because I want them to see the connection, but I want also to see, the, see how they have influenced each other. I just referred to you earlier on how devotees of African traditions, the uh, diaspora traditions, are now returning to Africa to interact with devotees of Orisha traditions or foreign traditions in West Africa. So why is African diasporic religion important to our understanding of African indigenous religions? Because it enables us to theorize questions of syncretism, hybridization, and more importantly, race, the issue, a uh, uh, question of why African religion is flowering and spreading in the Americas, especially in the United States, while it is declining in Africa. It's a very, very important question. A phenomena that we need to understand very clearly. It proves to us that on the continent, while the early modernizers assumed that African religion was part of the problem of the anti-modernity project, and that the uprooting of African indigenous religion will augur well for the modern African state. What we are seeing here in the new world is that the stone which the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone and central pillar for constructing the society and their culture. Santeria, for example, is central to Cuba and to United States. Uh, uh, in Miami, for example, in New York, in Chicago, you find the practice of Santeria among Latina, Latino people. And, on, on, and also until recently, when Pentecostalism has become responsible for the violence against, uh, against uh, candomblé, uh, devotees in Brazil, candomblé is very important, not only to the blacks in, in, in Brazil, but even to the nation of Brazil. African scholars in the United States are increasingly paying more attention to African images in African American culture and religion. Some of our scholars, especially literary critics, now uh, who have published extensively in literature, African-American novels, such as Tony Merizin, Alice Walker, uh, have references to African traditions. And others such as my colleague here, Henry Louis Gates, uh, who use Yoruba images of issue in, you know, in, his, in his own work. So the most interesting theories that came out of his work, of course, was based on how he theorized issue in the contemporary period. Significant as these studies are, there seems to be no systematic exploration of African in African-American traditions. What the sociologist E. Franklin Fraser in a parody described as the content and significance of African traditions in African-American culture. I'm not sure if I made the point clearly earlier on, 
when I was trying to look at what is in the Americas and the Africans and what Africans have missed in jettisoning their own indigenous traditions. Let me repeat myself. I am not conversing for a reconversion to indigenous African religion. All I'm trying to say is for Africans to understand the importance of these traditions, both in terms of the epistemology, the ontology, and in fact, their whole worldview. I personally think, and you may want to correct me, that one of the reasons where we are in the world in Africa, in a number of sectors, is that we have failed to recognize the importance and the validity of this, this tradition. And this is one of the reasons why with the present pandemic, Africans are reverting back to their local tradition to find solutions to the problems. And I hope you are paying attention as you look at what is happening in places like Madagascar, what is happening in places like Nigeria, and what is happening in places like Senegal, where they're coming out with very important responses to this crisis. The problem, of course, is that Africans keep looking for validation from the outside world. If WHO says it's not correct, it's not right, it is not right. This is what we have to deal with. It's a kind of a mental colonization that we need to respond to as Africans. Lastly, African religion and interreligious engagement and research. Understanding the contours of traditions as they are today consists of picturing both what they are and what they can be in the backdrop of what they once were. Religious contexts are shaped and determined by the identity of these religions. Representation matters. And as scholars, we have a responsibility to advocate for religion in their context. In the primordial era, various forms of ethnic indigenous religions spread across the African continent, providing cohesive foundations of nations, people, and religious worldviews. Based on sacred narratives, these traditions espoused their unique worldviews, they defined a cosmology, ritual practices, social political framework, and ethical standard, as well as social and personal identity. Yet, scholarship in the history of religions indicates that indigenous African religion were never considered a substantive part of world religious traditions because they failed to fulfill certain criteria defined by the Axia age civilization. So I must again uh, thank and congratulate GTU for recognizing the importance of indigenous religion and for inviting us to participate in this conversation of what we may call the parliament of world religious uh, scholarship. Scholars have singled out and thereby controlled African identity through this process of not recognizing the importance of tradition. For example, James Fraser and Edward Taylor classified indigenous religious practices as natives, not as universally religious or generative of religious culture, but they described them as forms of primitive religion or magic arising from the lure of three stages of human progress. These stages characterize European perceptions of human evolution. So scholars stereotyped African religion and African themselves as primitive social forms, part of a lower social order. The unfortunate part of it is that Africa is still battling with these kinds of mindset. I'm sure you are aware of all the stories we are hearing about responses to Africans who have found themselves in foreign countries and foreign places as it relates to the pandemic and how Africans are often described and viewed as animals and described in the most derogatory terms possible. African leaders must respond to this 
while it is easy to blame foreigners for what they are saying to us and how they are describing us, it is the responsibility of African leaders of thought, particularly the leaders, the, 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 those in charge of governance, to find a way of rescuing Africa out of this. And if they fail to do so, Africans themselves must recognize that they have the responsibility as people living either in Africa or outside Africa to engage in a peaceful, if you like, a peaceful jihad that will overturn these states of being. <clears throat> Responding to the erasure of African indigenous tradition as a productive and generative practice, scholars have rallied in opposition to this. And here I must recognize the work of scholars before us, Bolaji Do, John Mbiti, Wandi Abimbola, Gabriel Setlioni, Alonios Lugira, Kofi Asari Opoku, Ikenga Maitu, and Charles Long, and others who have attempted to imbue African traditions with the validity, status, and identity now recognized by us. African religions command their own cultural ingenuity, in integral logic, and authoritative force. So this collective scholarship and critical intervention help to define African worldview and spirituality, and as such, showed how African religion is pivotal to the individuals and communal existence of the people. Just as Muslim traders and sojourners introduced new world religions to North and West Africa, Western traders and missionaries introduced new world religions to the continent. Indigenous traditions, however, did not capitulate to these forms, but rather creatively domesticated the new faith, absorbing new rituals and tenets into their own belief system and responding to the exogenous modernity in its wake. Time permits me to cite only one example in this case. When I was in Israel in 2015 for a sabbatical leave, I stayed in a modest bread and breakfast inn near the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I ran into a co-resident, a former, a, a famous Swiss author. When he heard that I came from Nigeria, he wanted to display his knowledge of Orisha tradition as a devotee of Oshosi, uh, he claimed god of thunder in Afro-Brazilian heritage. When I told him, oh, um, I, I am a twin, Ibeji, from Yoruba tradition. And in principle, of course, twins are secret being. He almost fell on the floor to pay homage to me. <laughs> My credential as a Harvard professor made little sense to him. Our parting in the last week was hard for him a proper ongoing study of Ifa and other traditions in West Africa would enable us to understand how one group, the Yoruba West Africa, and even others like the four, have encountered transcendental and the sacred in practicing their tradition in ways radically different <coughs> from Western construction of, of, of religion. In conclusion, what is the implication of indigenous immunotics for scholarship today? I suggest that at conceptual and theoretical level, we begin to take this interpretive approach seriously. What, for example, is the notion of history and sacred knowledge in our counter system? And why should I work in critical theory, not begin from basic immunotics before we begin to invoke Martin uh, Heidegger, Michael Foucault, Jungins, Habermas, and even Paul Tillich. I know I'm speaking to GTU people. 
invoking them as platform for interpreting our own worldview and society. European theorists are important and we need to know and understand them to engage in serious global dialogue of culture. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should discard our own tradition as non-interpretive tradition, limited only for ethnographic illustrations. They certainly represent interpretive traditions. And when carefully studied, they form, and when carefully studied, they form very important part of her work and of her research. Um, I must say to you that one of the things I've enjoyed as a teacher and mentor at UC Davis and here is that I've been very fortunate to have students who are listening to some of these issues and these issues that we have raised. So for most of my PhD students who have graduated and they are doing very well all over the world. They know fully well that while it is important for them to understand European theories and European tradition, they should be able to talk about Foucault, uh, uh, Habermas, uh, Portillic, Heidegger, and the rest of them. They must also begin what they call theory building from the traditions they are studying. These traditions contain a lot to talk about they're capable of interpreting themselves. And if you combine it to what you have also learned from Western scholars, then you are going to come up with a very, very robust and complete understanding of what the tradition is all about. This has been my orientation. And I think this is part of my success uh, uh, story. And I hope that your university at GTU will be, continue to take active interest in understanding and studying indigenous tradition. They certainly represent important traditions and I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to have a conversation relating to how they compare with other traditions, but also understanding them in their own, in their own context, in their own way. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you again for inviting me. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lopuno for delivering this very important lecture with a great deal of energy and vigor, given the fact that Dr. Lopuno uh, just recovered uh, recently with a bout uh, with malaria and he's still very weak, but again, over 60 minute lecture with great deal of passion. And also, uh, you know, to give a lecture without seeing the reaction from the audience is very, very difficult. But again, uh, uh, you know, you uh, stay through the entire lecture without, again, uh, 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 decreasing the uh, amount of you know, passion and energy. At one point, we had close to 70 participants, uh, you know, four panelists and the you know, 66 uh, uh, attendees. Uh, while, you know, I, I wait for the Q&A, I only gotta take one or two uh, 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 Q&A questions, uh, but I, I actually have a question for you, uh, Dr. Alupono. I think your passionate and provocative call for scholars to study varied expressions, different traditions and localized practices of religion and life in African and African people as a, a single indigenous African you know, religion, uh, I think is very private, uh, provocative. And I think that has been heard very clearly by those who are attending this uh, webinar. And I think in the process, you want to elevate the you know, indigenous, indigenous African religion to the uh, status of that of the Judaism, uh, you know, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so on and so on. I think you already uh, mentioned in your lecture 
uh, some of the difficulties in doing that. And there's external factors and internal factors. And I just want to uh, raise one uh, question uh, from your comments. And that is when you were sharing the African creation myth story uh, as a biblical scholar, there was no doubt that there was such a similarity between what you were describing and the Mesopotamian creation myth, which, is, which are actually older than the biblical account. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's one of the reasons why there are differences between biblical creation myth and the African creation myth, because they're actually a lot older than the biblical you know, account. However, uh, given the you know, entrenched paradigm in the Western scholarship and the uh, tradition, uh, you know, scholars tend to see anything that is uh, come prior or outside of Judaism and Christianity as either inferior or primitive. So how do we ever overcome this kind of bias in the uh, <laughs> academia? Thank you very much. Quite, uh, you have actually three questions. <laughs> uh, you agree, but I'll quickly um, respond to that. Number one, we are not trying to uh, we are not trying to create a world religion that is comparable to Islam and Christianity or Buddhism and so on. We are simply asking scholars to understand African religion in his own context, in his own time, to give it the dignity it deserves, to begin to see it as a tradition that contributed a lot to the human society and human life. You know, what happened was that in the 60s, if you look at it, <clears throat> in the 60s and 70s, scholars were busy looking at texts. Uh, most of us who came to America for our graduate studies, we were compelled to deal with this. When my teachers discovered that I did Greek and Hebrew as undergraduate, even though I was not a New Testament scholar, I mean, a biblical scholar, they were shocked. That was part of the colonial system. Later on, they began to use some of the themes that we created that used to be central to our study. The questions of praxis, regional praxis, issues of rituals, questions of festivals. So if you look at the literature from 1980 onward, you find even scholars of the Bible gradually moving towards this model. It's an indication that they have been influenced by that. When we created the indigenous religion section at the American Academy of Religion, what we did was to invite scholars like you to be part of the conversation. I remember Duwen Mink, who used to be, uh, who used to, I think it was at Berkeley and then Harvard. Uh, he came for a conference we had. Some of your colleagues from uh, California, I mean, from uh, Berkeley came to see uh, Duwen Mink at Davis where I had this conference. So that is very important that we should, we are not going to spend all our time convincing uh, these scholars to change their mind. Some have made up their mind about African religion. There's nothing we can do about it. But I will simply just appeal to them to begin to look at these traditions and study them in terms of their essence and give them the, you know, the, uh, give them the kinds of respect that, you know, they deserve. I quite agree with you, uh, the reference you made to Mesopotamian uh, religion and the, the old biblical tradition. I hope you also know that for those of us who study in America, we were all exposed to these traditions. Even before we were allowed to look at our own the traditions, we came to America to study, which was unfortunate in that sense because we had to, we had to have a PhD. So I, I agree, I, quite, I agree with your, with your, with your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, th there is a, a question that is in a similar vein, so I'm going to read it out uh, loud. Uh, 
Do you believe that the decolonization of the African mind with regards to Yoruba religion is possible considering the fanatic obsession of Nigerians with Christianity and Islam in Nigeria specifically? Well, <laughs> it's going to be difficult. But what I see in the whole practice or the whole system is this. When we begin to have leaders of thought, and when we begin to have state men and women, you know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't say politicians because I've lost faith in them. When we begin to have state men and women who understand what we're talking about, they will now be in a position to go back to the drawing boards. And without asking people to change or to change to Islam and Christianity, I'm a Christian. I will remain a Christian till I die. I'm an Anglican, the son of an Anglican priest. So it's not conversion I'm talking about, but it's the mindset and the orientation. Look, I don't want to be too parochial here. I once made the point that why is it that if I travel to my own country, Nigeria, and I wear this, this, this clothes. By the way, this was given to me by my grandmother almost, I don't know, 45 years ago or even more. And uh, someone, uh, uh, I didn't want to say the professor, say someone from nowhere who is, who is, who is white, traveled to Lagos, that at the airport, he will be given more recognition than the Harvard professor called Jacob Olukona. Why is this so? So that means there's something going on that we need to deal with. And it is the role of our leaders of thought, our state men and women to sit down and think about it. A lot of things that are wrong with Africa, things that we are complaining, and by the way, there are lots of good things coming out of Africa. I'm sure you've heard about what Senegal is doing in response to the pandemic. I just mentioned uh, Madagascar. Things are happening all over the, in Nigeria. Things are happening. Good things that will never be reported uh, by CNN. Things that are bound to change every to change the whole world. Things are good. Things are happening. But we have not been fortunate enough to have good leaders. This is the issue. The elite must begin to think about these things. They must read. They must read what we write. They don't read what we write. They must listen to what we are saying. Most of the scholars who are in America and Europe and even in Nigeria, they are not asking for anything. Nobody is even asking them to, 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 to pay him or her on a room. They are simply saying, look at what we are proposing. How are we going to change our continent? These are our these are our recommendations. Please take them seriously. It's like we are begging them. So uh, the short answer to your question is that it will happen when we, we, we have leaders who are able to understand the nature of the problem. Because if you don't understand the nature of the problem, you will not be able to solve it. It's like talking about, uh, say, for example, corruption in a number of African countries. If we don't have leaders who understand what corruption is doing to us, leaders were able to make the connection that the bad roads we have, the fact that we don't have uh, good hospitals, they are all connected with this thing they call corruption. If we have leaders who are willing to respond to that, then there's going to be a change of heart. That would be my, my response. Thank you. And this is gonna be the last question because I mean, I am very mindful of you know, Dr. Olupona's uh, condition. What do you suppose is the greatest challenge scholars of comparative religions will face in studying, teaching, researching African American, uh, sorry, African religions in a fast digitiz uh, digitizing world? Well, part of the, uh, the, the, I think the greatest challenge is 
to be able to identify the necessary materials to use. Number two, to also recognize that it cannot be done in isolation. What is the purpose of studying and teaching African religion here in America, devoid of what is happening in Africa or at home? A lot of things are happening. The materials are there. How do we have access to them? Uh, how do we have access to materials in archives that have been plundered and that are empty? So uh, the challenge is also, the solution is also in that same question, that because we live in this digital, digital age, we are now in a better position to engage the scholars to begin to see a way of creating assets to these materials by digitizing them and making them uh, possible. The other part of the challenge is, has to do with recognition. Until our colleagues recognize the importance of these traditions in human history, the contribution the tradition has made to humanity, we will not be in a position to find scholars who are willing to support it, the research or even the teaching of the traditions in our, trad in, in our universities. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get to other questions. I just wanna thank everyone who joined this webinar. You truly honored uh, Dr. Lopona's uh, fabulous uh, lecture. And also you honor the memory and work of you know, Dr. Sujit Singh. So I just wanna thank everyone uh, for joining this lecture. And again, Dr. Alupono, thank you thank so you. much for giving us this lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, my family for the assistance and the help they have rendered me. Uh, thank you. I greet all our people for us uh, in California. Tell them I miss them. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.